I, want to, I really thank um, Professor Momoli for inviting me, and we've had really good conversations today. So this was the plan for the talk. I was going to explain um, conjecture of valiant, which probably many of you know already, and a variant, uh, which at least some of you certainly know. And then I was going to start talking about some of the relevant mathematics for this program. And I was going to make some remarks uh, on this program. And th these two parts of the talk, are, are, it's kind of hard to avoid. It, it's kind of technical. Uh, so the, the good news is, is I'm not going to give this part of the talk. And um, instead, we had some very recent results that um, I'd like to talk about instead. Uh, and this is joint with um, Laurent Manivelle and um, Nicolas Essayer. And so the good news is, is that this is a lot less technical than what I was going to discuss. So to any of you who want sort of some hardcore representation here, I'll be happy to explain it to you in private. So let's see. So uh, Les Valiant proposed um, algebraic analogs of the classes P and NP, uh, which I'm not going to get into since everyone here knows better than I do. And he, I guess now they're called VP and VNP. And a problem, or some kind of decision problem or whatever, it would have been in the old setting, instead one studies sequences of polynomials. And the, so you have some polynomial, and it'll be some polynomial in some number of variables, which will depend on n. We'll have a sequence. And it'll be of some degree, uh, which will also depend on n, and in number of variables. So I like to think of the vector space of all polynomials, which I'll write as S for symmetric. Uh, and we're going to use complex numbers, which is a difference, a departure from traditional complexity theory. But there's reasons for doing that. Um, so we'll be dealing with sequences of polynomials where the degree and the number of variables is allowed to is growing, but not too fast. These numbers d of n and v of n uh, should be polynomials themselves for the theory. And then there's this class vp, which roughly speaking is um, the sequences um, that can be evaluated um, in a number of steps that's polynomial uh, in n. So we'll just call this polynomial time. And then there's this class VNP, which roughly speaking is sequences where a proposed solution can be checked quickly. And the question is, is as you probably know, is, is, is this class of polynomial of sequences of polynomials larger than this class of sequences? Okay, so let's let's do some simple examples. So uh, let's 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 look at the sequence of polynomials of degree n in n squared variables. I'm going to be mostly talking about that today. So here's a simple polynomial. You'll just take say y1, raise it to the nth power, up to y n squared, raised to the nth power, and this is clearly in the class VP, because even if you wrote this out, wrote out the expression, there would only be some small number of pluses and times involved, you know, n squared times n or something, not, not a whole lot. So that's clearly in VP, and you don't need to do any thinking at all. So um, 
a more subtle example is the determinant of an n by n matrix. So let me, I'm going to use double indices, so I have some matrix. And the determinant of this, as you probably know the formula, you take um, all permutations formula. You do. I'm sorry. Yes, I think you. <laughs> it's okay. I'm going to write it anyway. Go ahead. <laughs> and um, I want to look at this formula though, because you see here we just have okay, we got n squared terms, and it's no big deal. Here, there's n factorial terms. That's a, a big number I, I learned recently. Um, but nonetheless, this polynomial can be evaluated quickly. And I know you all know that it can be evaluated quickly, and I know you know how you can evaluate it quickly. But I'm going to tell, I'm going to prove for you, nonetheless, how to evaluate it quickly because I want to introduce a, a geometric perspective. Because the the idea why I got fascinated by this problem is because of the role of geometry and the role of symmetry, that is representation theory, and so. We should even go back to the things that we know so well we never think about and think about them again to make sure. So I'm going to give you, yeah, so this is in this class VP, and I'm going to give you the idea of the proof even though you know it already. So of course, you know the proof, you say, ah, it's Gaussian elimination. But let me just. Let's do it anyway, right? So the point is, is if I have an upper triangular matrix, matrix, something with zeros below the diagonal, and I restrict the determinant to these matrices, well, then the formula just is this simple thing, and this is easy to evaluate. On the other hand, we can look at the group. So let me introduce some notation. Um, let's let GL n squared be the set of all invertible linear maps. From CN squared to CN squared. And inside here, let's let G determinant n be the subgroup preserving the determinant. So if I write cn squared, thinking of it as n by n matrices, I could think of this tensor product of cn with cn. And I'm just going to give these, since these two look too similar, let me just give them different names, e and f. And then this group is almost the same as uh, um, I can multiply the matrix on the uh, right, and it won't change the determinant if this is determinant 1. And it won't change it if I multiply it on the left either. So this, is, this S is so that the product of the determinants is equal to 1. So this is a matrix M would go to A M B. And the determ if the determinant of A is 1 over the determinant of B, this won't change. Now, the idea is to exploit the action of this large group. So the point is that, of course, if, if I have some G in this group, that is, it's some pair of matrices A and B, and I multiply on the left and right, I will not change the value of the determinant. But I want to think of the group acting on the space if I look at its orbit. The orbit of this group 
define the upper triangular matrices is the space of all matrices. And this group is cheap to use. So the reason determinant is easy to evaluate is because there exists some subspace that I can restrict to where it becomes trivially easy to evaluate. And because I have a group action, I have a symmetry, and that group is sufficiently robust that it can move. Somebody picks a matrix. Somebody who doesn't like me picks a matrix, says, well, evaluate that. I say, I don't care. I'm going to move that matrix till it becomes easy to compute. So you still, you still have to make sure that the information is used to move for the matrix depends nicely on the matrix itself. Yeah, so this is this idea of proof. Yes. Okay. Now, um, now this group is so important, in fact, that I did not need to. In fact, not because you knew the formula, but because the formula is kind of baggage, from my perspective. The the whole thing driving the determinant is this group, in in the following sense that, in fact. So that's the end of the idea. In fact, uh, the determinant is uniquely determined up to scale uh, by this group. So let me make precise that statement. So um, let me write a W for C n squared, which again I think of as E times F, space of n by n matrices. And I want to look at space of homogeneous polynomials of degree n on, um, on W star, on the dual space. So this is the space of homogeneous polynomials of degree n on W star on Cn squared. And I can this is as far as changes of bases in W is concerned, this space cannot be chopped up further. There's no invariant subspaces. But when I think of this not like that, but under the group under this group GLE cross GLF, where I only allow myself left and right multiplication by matrices, I can chop up my space of polynomials into smaller spaces that are left invariant by this group. So for example, one thing I could do is I could take a polynomial on E and tensor it with a polynomial on F, and that'll give me a polynomial on E tensor F. And there's a whole bunch of other terms that we'll get to later in the talk. And the last thing I can do is I could take an alternating form on E and tensor it with an alternating form on F. So these are sort of the opposites of polynomials. They, everything goes wrong. They're completely anti-symmetric. But when you've got two of them and you put them together, the anti-symmetry cancels and you get a polynomial. And this is a one-dimensional vector space. And this is the home of the determinant. And it's the only one-dimensional vector space inside here that's invariant under the action of this group. So the determinant is completely determined by the group that preserves it. OK. Oh, we, we need a few more examples. So let's do another example. Um, so there's this other polynomial that people like called the permanent. So if I was still in, in, in high school or, yeah? Like to pull down the whiteboard that's behind. Yeah. Hmm? Okay. Refer for this? Okay. Yeah, because the other one that you can write you cannot remove. Ah, I see. Thank you. So, right. So there's this permanent. And like I said, you know, the first time you learn about determinants, you hate them because you never remember the signs. So this is great because you don't have to remember the signs. It's the same thing. But everything gets a plus sign. So you sum over all permutations. You do the same thing. It's the exact same polynomial except you get all plus signs. And it also shares this property 
that when I restrict this permanent to the upper diagonal matrices, it's still just easy. But the group preserving this polynomial is much, much smaller than the group preserving the determinant. The group preserving the permanent is basically, I take the diagonal matrices in, on the left times the permutation matrices. And, well, semi, and same on the right. And, well, I could also take transpose, which I forgot about for the determinant, but that's okay. And that's it. So this is, has dimension 2n, whereas this one had dimension 2n squared, or 2n squared minus 1. This is 2n minus 1. Okay. So, but uh, nonetheless, the permanent is also uniquely characterized by this group. Namely, when I took this space, of, and now I'm really grateful, because I need this board and that board at the same time. When I take this space of polynomials, and I split it up, so this is as a G debt space, I can chop it up. If I have a smaller group, I can chop it up into tinier pieces. And if I look in this smaller group, this space here will have a lot of spaces. And let me write the first one as SNE0, and so SNF0. So I'm going to start using some dirty words. If you don't know them, ignore them. This is the weight 0 subspace. It's the space that the diagonal matrices um, act on only by uh, rescaling. And then there's a whole bunch of other spaces inside here. And again, this turns out to be one dimensional. So there's a unique polynomial. Well, there's actually two because this one's still preserved by that group anyway. But essentially, unique polynomial in this space governed by this group. And somehow, the hope is that this complexity theory can be understood in terms of the actions of these groups. Any questions? I, I'm missing what this means. I mean, the determinant is preserved by this group, so uh, yes. it's the only new one. And what? It's the only new one. The only new one? So, I think that's not the determinant. Well, you, but, but you cannot take, yeah, but there's a subtlety here. Um, you cannot take a linear, so it's, it's not that the two-dimensional space spanned by these is preserved by the group. It's these isolated vectors are preserved. So it's up to, fi up to finiteness, it's unique. So determinant plus permanent, okay, all right. Or we could deal with filtration, filtrations in projective space, which I actually like better. And then we have a very nice filtration. We have a line and then a two-plane. And it's going to expand a little bit further later into the talk. And actually, I like that better. But let's just keep it at this for, for now. No, it isn't. I, I apologize. If you actually are preserving, uh, you see here, I'm allowed a permutation matrix on the permanent with a, with a minus sign, and that will not preserve the determinant. It's only the lines that are preserved, but the polynomial determinant is not. It's sent to minus determinant. So it is the unique polynomial in this space invariant under this group. But the, but the lines are Variant, but if you want an individual polynomial, it's the unique one up to scale. Okay, so um, the theorem due to Valiant is that this thing, while it looks bad, is still not too bad. It's, it's in this class BNP, namely, even if you can't compute it quickly, at least you can verify a proposed solution quickly. And in fact, is BNP complete? 
So, I'm, I, so stop me, I'm doing kind of the opposite of what I do when talking to mathematicians. Here I'm just assuming you know all the complexity theory terms and spelling out all the math, but if I need to spell out some things, please let me know. And if you're bored, you can let me know too, but I'm still going to bore you nonetheless. Um, okay, so and, and the conjecture uh, uh, valiant, as you guessed, is that this uh, VP is not equal to VNP, i.e. that the permanent is not in this class VP. That's all you need to prove. And um, he actually conjectured a slightly stronger version. Um, so, uh, and, and let me be a little bit more precise. So say P in some variables Y1 up to YS. Uh, so, do it aside first. Definition. Uh, is a linear projection of some Q of some X1, XT, if we, when we write, if there exists constants, C, I, alpha, C, what do I want, J, such that um, X alpha is the summation, C, I alpha, Y, I plus some C alpha, I guess, um, such that uh, P of Y1 YS is Q of that thing, summation C alpha YI plus, uh, oh, so. I, I think I messed up my indices, but hopefully you'll forgive me. But anyway, it's a linear projection if you can make some substitution of variables. And this essentially says that um, P is not much more difficult. P, is, as far as complexity theory is concerned, is no harder to compute than Q. And um, so the determinant is not known to be complete for VP, but nonetheless, since it's so dear to the hearts of so many people, uh, Valiant made a stronger version of his conjecture, uh, stronger conjecture, uh, also Valiant. Um, actually, let, let me introduce some further notation. So let's let um, DC, for determinantal complexity, of say the permanent in M variables, be the um, smallest n such that the permanent in M variables is a linear projection of the determinant in N variables. And um, the conjecture is that this grows, grows faster than polynomially. And so far, uh, so far, the best result known, the best lower bound, oh, this could be bad, best lower bound is um, that this is greater than or equal to m squared over 2 plus 2, and that's due to um, Thierry Mignon and Nicolas Resser. Well, you, I already wrote his name once. Okay. Why are uh, you saying that this conjecture is stronger? His main result is that they are equivalent. No. Yes. It is not known that the determinant is complete for VP. It's only known to be in VP. There a priori could be more difficult problems in VP than the determinant. Uh, okay, so that concludes part one. Part two, um, I'm going to start part two with just restating the conjecture. So when I, I, I write down these formulas, it's kind of embarrassing because you tell me I don't need to write them down. And I really don't want to write them down because I want to think about things as geometric objects. And so when I have a polynomial, I don't want to look at the polynomial because that doesn't have shape to it. I'm a geometer. I want to look at a geometric object, but it does have something 
that I can associate to it that does have a shape. It's zero set. And so the transition will be a transition from looking at polynomials and formulas to looking at the shapes of zero sets of polynomials. And so uh, it, it turns out now there's this funny thing that people like to do in algebraic geometry. They don't want to deal with any old polynomials. They like homogeneous polynomials. And if you've got a polynomial that's not homogeneous, it's no big deal. You just add an extra variable and multiply all your terms by that variable to whatever power you want. You got yourself a homogeneous polynomial. So we're going to do that now. So um, I'm going to, instead of working with cm squared, space of m by m matrices with coordinates yj, I'm just going to add another variable with coordinate l. And um, that way, if I look at l to the n minus m, times the permanent of m, I can consider that as a homogeneous, it is a homogeneous polynomial of degree n on m squared plus 1 variables. And of course, I could include this into cn squared any way I want and consider it as a homogeneous polynomial in n squared variables. And it just doesn't involve all the variables. It only involves a first few of them. And the reason for doing it is now I have this thing and the determinant, they live in the same space. They have the same home. And I want to compare those polynomials. I want to compare their zero sets and all kinds of things like that. And so the thing is, if I, if, no, if I, if I homogenize, um, the thing is I want to consider this as a projection of this. Or I could change coordinates and I don't care. Change coordinates doesn't mean anything. So if you think about it, what is the thing that takes into account all changes of coordinates and all linear projections? It's the space of all linear maps. Uh, I, yeah, I'm going to start calling C n squared. I'm going to write W. And so the endomorphisms of W, this is all linear maps. C n squared to C n squared. And I could act on this by the determinant. And that would give me, in particular, all possible projections of the determinant. And the question is, so that I can rephrase the conjecture just by rephrasing the definition of determinantal complexity, this is the smallest n such that this permanent point homogenized lies in this set. OK? So I've just rephrased the conjecture. OK. And now we're going to do, so first we went slightly stronger. Now we're going to go slightly weaker. Um, if you want to do algebraic geometry, you want to deal with things that are zero sets of polynomials. And if somebody hands you a set that's not a collection, a zero set of polynomials, you, you're so prejudiced and so biased, you force it to be zero set of polynomials. So what you do is you take the collection of all polynomials that vanish on your set, and then you look at the common zeros of all those polynomials, and that'll be a slightly bigger set. And you say, well, that's what I want to work with, because that's algebraic geometry. And so that's what we're going to do here. Um, this is Mamoli and Sohoni's idea. So this will be a weaker conjecture. Study this closure. And the membership of this point in this closure. And now I could have just restricted to all invertible maps and taken closure because um, projections are limits of changes of coordinates. And now this is very nice. This is an algebraic variety. That's nice, it's a geometric object. And it's nicer because it's a variety invariant under the action of a group. Obviously, if I have any point in here, I let my group, this big GLW, act, it's still in the variety. Go ahead. This conjecture is still stronger because we are going to prove the opposite fact that the permanent is not in this closure. It's stronger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's equivalent. 
No, no, it's not. It's what he's saying is that this conjecture would imply the original one. Right. It's what? stronger. Yeah, it's a weaker hypothesis. So it's a stronger conclusion. It's not very yes, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and so, but here it's, it's kind of asymmetrical. Here we have a point, and here we have a variety. But of course, if I make a linear change of coordinates here, it's, if this is in, any linear change of coordinates of it is going to be in. So what we're going to study is this um, the orbit closure of this point. And so the, let's let dc bar permanent and be the smallest and such that this thing holds. And as you remarked, this dc bar is a priori less than or equal to dc, less than or equal to dc. And the conjecture is that this dc bar of permanent m grows faster than m to the p for all p. Okay, so I got the conjecture stated, and um, so this is Romoli and Sahoni. And so now, you know, if you're a geometer, you really like this. This looks like, you know, a lot of fun. Okay, so, but if you're a geometer, you're still kind of not entirely happy because um, it's nicer to work in projective space. See, these sets are cones in a vector space. They're scale invariant. And so we might as well just get rid of that scale, because that's not changing anything. So we might as well work in projective space. Because that's a nice compact space. It's nice and small. You can put it in your pocket and whatever. OK. so. Um, that's the statement of the conjecture. And now uh, I need to tell you how one could hope to prove it. And that'll be part three. Any other questions? I, I have a question. What time should I stop talking? No, because some people have 50 minute talks and some people have hour talks. Uh, no, one hour either. Yeah, this one hour. Yeah, at least one hour. And at five, uh, there is a small chance that at five, you will be bothered by that. So, anyway, I should stop at quarter of then, right? No, no, no. Well, okay. Well. Uh, okay, because we're getting kind of to the. A little slightly technical part of the talk. And so if you're planning on going to sleep for a few minutes, um, this might not be a bad time. <laughs> your time to imply that what we have seen so far was easy. Hmm? Your time to imply that what we have seen so far was easy. Um, I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying I didn't have to use a lot of terminology. And uh, now I'm going to be obligated to use some words that I've been postponing as long as possible. So, um, so, so let me tell you the idea before I get into the details. Um, the, the idea is very simple. Um, it's a common thing we do in mathematics, and also, you know, a saying: "It's you, you are what you eat, or you are what you, you know, regurgitate." Also, so you 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 understand what an object is by test by by putting test functions on it. So. What we could study instead of these objects are the polynomials that vanish on them. They're a homogeneous ideals. And you see, their ideals will be ideals of polynomials, collections of ideal of polynomial, because if I have a polynomial that vanishes on this thing and I multiply it by anything else, it's still going to vanish. That makes it an ideal of polynomials. That's true for any old algebraic variety. But you see, because this variety is invariant under the group action, the collection of polynomials that vanishes on it must be invariant under the group action. And so you can use the tools from representation theory to study the modules of polynomials that vanish on this set and the modules of polynomials that vanish on this set. And the idea is to prove that unless n is really big, you will show that this thing is not contained in this by finding a polynomial that vanishes on this one that does not vanish on that one. Because if this were contained, anything vanishing on the big thing would have to vanish on the small. That's the idea. It's a really nice idea. 
And it's just absolutely beautiful. I mean, it goes back hundreds. I mean, this is how people have been doing algebraic geometry for the last 300 years. You know. So, OK. So, but now I need to tell you, because, see, we want to use our symmetry to organize our space of polynomials, to split it up. I mean, we don't want to just kind of pick a polynomial at random, needle out of a haystack, needle out of a haystack. We would never have any hope of solving this thing. So we want to use this group action to organize our space of polynomials in a way that it's completely tractable. Okay? So the first thing we're going to need is a list of vector spaces that that group acts on. So GLW acts irreducibly. That means it has no invariant subspace. Well, it, it certainly acts irreducibly on W. It acts irreducibly on the space of homogeneous polynomials of degree D on W. It acts on the skew forms on W irreducibly as well. These are all the easy ones. And now, well, we could try and mix and match. We could take a skew form and then take a homogeneous polynomial of degree D. And this is a vector space that that group acts on. It's distinct from anything else on the list so far. But it is not irreducible. But it contains a nice irreducible subspace. If I take the vector E1 wedged up to EK, I multiply it by itself as a polynomial D times. That vector is in that space. I could take the orbit of that vector and then the linear space spanned by that orbit. And let me call that, I'm going to call this some funny name, S uh, D. W, where there's this k, k of those. And this is another space that it acts irreducibly on. And we're almost, miraculously, um, I can almost give you a complete list of all spaces. I will give you a complete list of all spaces it acts on. The miracle is, is you just mix and match from the above list. Namely, um, let's let, uh, let's let pi be some set of numbers p1 up to, so let me just write the dimension of w equals n for the moment, big n, which will be n squared for us later on. Uh, and let's look at, uh, let's write s pi bar w is going to sit inside s p1 minus, so uh, yeah, p one greater than or equal to p2, da, 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 greater than or equal to pn, which would be greater than or equal to 0. p1 minus p2, lambda 1w, tensor sp2 minus p3, lambda 2w, all the way up to spn, lambda nw. This is our friend, the determinant at the end, in disguise again. And then I can take the vector. Um, E1 to the P1 minus P2, tensor E1 wedge E2 to the P2 minus P3, etc., up to E1 wedge wedge En to the whatever I, whatever you put there, Pn. And then I take the orbit of this and I take its span, and that is what this S pi bar W is. And I've given you now a complete list. Everything is of this form. Um, all irreducible vector spaces, GLW axon, are of this form. Or this form times a negative power, uh, a negative power, because I can have. Um, an action of a one-dimensional vector space. I have G and GLW. I can have the vector V go to 1 over determinant G to the S times V. And that's also a vector space that this group acts on. That's kind of an outlier. It won't play much of a role for us. Um, and that's a list of every possible vector space it could act on. We're going to be interested in vector spaces of polynomials that this group acts on. So whatever the polynomials are, they must come from this list as an abstract vector space, as an abstract module. Not necessarily that model, but something equivalent to that. 
Now, um, oh, and by the way, uh, if you want to do the matrices with determinant one instead of arbitrary invertible matrices, you have the exact same picture, except you demand that this number be zero. Oh, I should have said, in case you do get bored now, the, the last five minutes of the talk will be fun again. So, uh, so you could go out and come back for. Okay, so, right, so, um, so, all right, so now what we have here, this space that we're interested in, and that one, but this one's really hard, so I'll talk mostly about this one today. Um, this is, I can think of this as a space is the quotient of GLW modulo the stabilizer of a point um, it's the same space and this is a group quotiented and I can tell you um, so we could either study so in the you are what you eat world I could also study polynomials that don't vanish on the thing equally well, the, and the space, the, the space of functions on my variety. And so sometimes we're going to go to that dual setting. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you the space of functions on this set before I take the closure, and then we'll worry about the closure later. So first, I'm going to tell you all the functions so for the ringers in the audience, regular functions on, um, on just GLW itself. Uh, and that's as follows. So let's let, let, let V be one of these S pi uh, Ws. Doesn't matter which one. And then um, let's let uh, alpha be in V star, the dual vector space, and V in V. And so alpha will eat V and spit out a number. And I get a function, F alpha tensor V, which will be a function on my group. Namely, G will go to, well, instead of alpha eating V, it'll let eat G times V. So that's a perfectly good function on my group. And so we see that V tensor V star is a space of functions on G. And in fact, the span this is so, so this is some theorem, classical theorem. These span all the functions. So let me and well, there's this determinant thing too. But let's not worry about that. This is all regular functions on my space is just obtained by that. And this space is acted on by the group, but in fact it's acted on the group in two ways. The group can either act on that factor or on that factor. Well, we're not interested in the group. We're interested in a quotient. But let's let H and G be a subgroup, a nice subgroup. Let's not worry about how nice. Then I claim the functions on G mod H is just a quotient of this space. Namely, it's the um, sum. So G acts on both sides. I'm going to look at the elements in this vector space. The vector is fixed by H. And now the group G does not act on this anymore because I've chopped up something irreducible, but it still acts on this. And this is a complete list of the irreducible modules for my group. And now I want to know which of these um, apply in my particular situation. This one. So I need to know for each of these vector spaces, what are the vectors in these vector spaces that are not moved by the action of this group? That's the next step. Well, let's 
just, let's just skip that because I don't want to, I think it's going to be a little. So let's just let k, k pi, well, I'm going to use some notation, delta n, delta n, be the dimension of the space of the subspace of s pi w fixed, or s pi w star maybe, doesn't matter. No, well, fixed by this group. So it turns out that this, these numbers, I wrote it down like this, these numbers have been studied long time. This goes back to Kronecker. So you see it's kind of a new question into the world of mathematics, this P versus NP, but the mathematics that it touches on goes back a long time. Kronecker's some long time ago guy. And um, these coefficients have been studied since Kronecker. And so all we need to know to solve the next step of our problem is to know the value of those numbers. And this has been an open question in mathematics for the past few hundred years. And there's almost nothing known about these numbers, very little. So um, in the work I'm not talking about, we, we sort of gathered we, we were more librarians in the sense. We gathered everything that was known about these things in, a, in this particular situation. There's a more general thing of a k pi mu nu, but let's not worry about it. We gathered that information and we saw how it could possibly apply to this problem. Now, the, yeah, the thing is a, 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 little, a little nasty because I tricked you. I told you what the functions were in this, not the functions on this. So in, you, you know, like if you have the complex plane, right? And then you take out the origin. So here you have the origin missing. And here you have the whole plane. Um, if you look at the functions here, it's power series in z and 1 over z. But the functions here that survive, that can extend to the entire plane, is just Taylor series in z. And so when I go from an open object to its closure, I lose some of my functions. And thanks to Hartog's theorem, you only need to look at the co-dimension 1 components of your boundary to see which functions extend. That's good news. The bad news is, is one must know what these co-dimension 1 components of the boundary are. And moreover, then one must solve the extension problem in each of these codimension one components. Now, there's some obvious there's one obvious codimension one component of the boundary here, namely given by the linear projections. The orbit of the projections gives you some codimension one components, and it was pretty straightforward to solve the extension problem in that. But we don't know what all the components are. There's a there's a really cool one I'll tell you about because it, it's a very interesting polynomial of its own right. So a determinant, you could think of m going to determinant. I think I can think of it as a multilinear form. And if n is odd, I can write m as a sum of a skew symmetric matrix and a symmetric matrix. And um, one of the components of the boundary is the polynomial p of p n of m, which is m goes to determinant of the skew symmetric part. Well, if I just took the skew symmetric part, I'd get 0, because n is odd. Determinant of a skew symmetric matrix that's odd is 0. You all know that? Anyway, so I put the regular m in the last one. And you take the orbit of this, you get a very beautiful, this is a beautiful polynomial. So it, it has a lot of spectacular properties. The determinant of his Hessian vanishes identi identically. And so this was, this class of polynomials, it turns out, was studied again 100 years ago by algebraic geometers. And it's, it plays a role in the story here. Uh, unfortunately, we were not yet able to solve the extension problem here, though. It's, it's um, we know how to, we know how one could solve, we have reduced it to a problem in representation theory that we cannot solve. So, okay, so let's see. Uh, yeah, and so there's some other things I'm not going to talk about because I'd like to uh, get back to this recent results with Laurent Manivelle and Nicolas Resser. I'm kind of, actually, it's so recent that I'm still jet lagged from these results. I was working with them over in Grenoble. And um, so at some point, we got so fed up with the representation theory 
we decided, well, what can, what can just purely geometric perspective say? Let's just forget about representation theory. And again, we're going to use this trick. So if I have some variety x contained in some larger variety y contained in my vector space, in this case, any, if I know the ideal here, then I get at least some of the equations for my smaller thing, right? And so the idea was to look for something nice that we could understand that contains this thing. Well, the determinant, the zero set of the determinant, we all know what that is. That's the matrices with determinant zero, matrices of rank less than maximal. And that has a that set of matrices thought of as a, a variety. If I have a hypersurface of any kind, some Z inside PV, a hypersurface, I can define its Gauss map, for, which is a map from Z, well, from the smooth points of Z to the um, dual projective space, the space of hyperplanes. In PV, just a little point Z goes to its tangent space. <laughs> and then I can take the closure of the image of this map, and I get something called Z dual in the dual projective space, often called the dual variety of Z. And if you look at the space of n by n minus n by n matrices with determinant zero as a as a geometric object, the dual geometric object is the space of rank at most of rank one matrices, which is a very small set. Now a generic hypersurface, the dual will also be a hypersurface. And it's a pathological property of this determinant, the zero set of determinant has the pathological property that the dimension of this thing, of the dual, is 2n minus 2n minus 2, whereas expected n squared minus 2. So it's a lot smaller than expected. That's a pathological property. And the idea is to exploit this pathology that's very special to the determinant. Let's consider all polynomials such that the dual of the zero set has dimension at most 2n minus 2. So this is a very natural geometric object. It's a very natural subset of the set of all polynomials. One such subset is the cones over small spaces. Those will have that small dimension. And another is the determinant. So we were like kind of really happy when we realized this. And then we thought, well, surely the equations for this are known. So we emailed the experts. They're mostly in Italy, so it wasn't so many, same time zone even. And we got back instant reply. Oh, yeah, this is a long standing open problem for 100 years. But unlike all the other long standing open problems that have been open for the last 100 years, we solved this one. So we solved this problem last week. We found the set of, well, set theoretic defining equations for varieties with degenerate duals. And in particular, that gave us some elements of the ideal of polynomials vanishing here. And it's also nice. So working on, working on a complexity theory problem led us to solve this 100-year-old problem in algebraic geometry. So that was very, I, I should say, you know, to say it's a 100-year-old problem is kind of a little misleading because it was actively studied 100 years ago. It was actively studied 50 years ago. And then people f forgot about it and couldn't care less because modern algebraic geometry is not concerned with such old-fashioned questions, no matter how beautiful they are. So. But some of us are. OK. Where are we? Oh, yeah. So by the way, there's a consequence of this. Um, a, a consequence I should have mentioned, I, I could have done it even before I said that, is the other theorem. Uh, 
is that because this dual variety is degenerate, we get a lower bound um, of m squared over 2. And I should say, this is great because this is the first lower bound that's nonlinear. It's also completely useless for our point of view of p versus np because um, this is the same bound you get for generic hypersurface. And that's so, so aesthetically it's nice because we got our foot in the door, we actually accomplished something, but you shouldn't get too excited about it because we still don't know why the permanent is different from a generic hypersurface and that's what I've been asking Kitan about all day long. In fact, it's, it's different, right? The other one was dc perm m squared than equal to m squared over 2 plus 2. So it's essentially the same. But, but, but it's essentially the same, but it's apart different. From that plus two, we know the plus two is stronger. Yeah, because you see your body is smaller. Yes. Well, if you don't care about plus two, this is no, certainly stronger. Yes. Okay. So you are improving. So that's yes, but it's still, but it's still nothing to write home about to the complexity theory world because this is just telling us something special about the permanent, about the determinant. It's not telling us anything special about the permanent per se, because the permanent has a non-degenerate dual, and so the permanent. No, no, see, see. Is there, is, there is a fundamental difference between DC bar and DC. That's what you are saying, right? Yes, you are correct. Yeah. But yes. what I'm saying. Is don't get excited. No, I mean, yeah. conceptually, it's a stronger statement. I agree. It, it implies the m squared over to lower bound in the naive sense. Yes. But it's a more sophisticated lower bound. Yes. But, uh, but I want to tell you about these equations, right? Because this, we, we can actually wrote, we, we can explicitly write down these equations and test them on the permanent, for example, if we wanted to. But before we test it, we want to know what the gap is between this. Can you do, that? Can what? You do the explicit equations for this result? No. No. That's why I said I should have said it before, but I forgot. Because it's not as exciting to me as, you know, when you, you solve an old question, you really feel good, you know, so. No, uh, I know, I know, and that's why I apologize for not saying it earlier, but anyway. Um, but now I, I want to explain something else. The, this thing is dimension strictly greater than the dimension of this, because the set of cones, which I told you cones have degenerate map, is much already much larger than this dimension of this variety. So you might say this is not such a great theorem from that point of view. We, we're, we're only seeing a small pit of the ideal. But this, this, this variety y is a disjoint union of different pieces of different dimensions. So this has, has many, uh, I don't know many, but has several irreducible components. That is, it's a disjoint union of some y1, y2, etc. And one of these is the set of what I, what I was calling the set of cones, the things that um, only involve um, only involve two n two n minus two variables. Then that'll be uh, something. And so our big theorem. is that this thing is an irreducible component of this variety y. So this is a big theorem because this means that the equations here are actually really useful because Okay, there's a lot of other junk that satisfies the equations, but it's far away from what we care about. And so if something is close to this, we can rule out it being in those other components, then these actually give us the equations. And oh, and I should have said the equations, these equations are of degree 2n squared minus 2n, just for the record. So they're pretty low degree, relatively speaking. And we actually have a bound that they could not be of degree much smaller than this, we also proved. Because once we got this, we said, well, maybe we can get even better equations. And we proved you might be able to get better, but not a whole lot better. That's another theorem. So this is, this is I think, uh, uh, probably a useful development. And I'll stop here.